Hello, everyone, and welcome to the State of the Booker Prize today, where we're going to be talking about literary change within literary prizes, and also just like what's been up with the Booker Prize lately and some of that stuff. So to get us started, I wanted to go over some history of literary prizes. So they developed in the 19th century originally by academics to give literary merit to books, basically just telling readers what they should read. But by the 20th century, prizes became more about what readers valued. Today, there are more prizes than there used to be. Some argue that because there are so many, reading, winning a prize is not that special. After all, if everyone has one, what's the point? But there are many reasons for literary prizes. So according to Bourdieu, uh, there are three main types of capital, economic, cultural, and symbolic. Ep economic capital is the monetary power you command. Cultural capital concerns forms of cultural knowledge, competencies, or dispositions, which give the agent an appre uh, appreciation for cultural artifacts. Finally, symbolic capital is a form of value that comes from others believing in it. In the case of literary prizes, the, the award is seen as prestigious because people within the publishing industry believe it to be. Right? So because the Booker Prize has so much economic capital to gain, right, between the 50,000 pounds given to the author, between the excess books sold because they are labeled a Booker Prize, and between the sponsors as well, they can earn a lot more capital because the publishing industry seems the Booker as this cultural capital um, books that really resound to, to British culture, and then also to symbolic capital as well in terms of people pertaining to the value of um, these books. However, there was a switch um, in this, and the Booker became really started to be criticized in 1991 because although 60% of books published in the UK were by women, no women authors were shortlisted for the Booker Prize that year. In response, the Orange Prize, or that later became the Women's Prize in Fiction, was born to fill the gap of women's representation within these big prestigious literary prizes. Um, this became super, super rampant within the literary community. Um, the Women's Prize in Fiction was a big competitor for the Booker Prize, and the Booker Prize knew that they had to change something. There's a lot of conversation about how um, they can amp up their representation, including thinking about having an all-women's judges panel. Um, however, that got disproved. There was only two women in the 1993 Booker um, Prize panel. Um, however, there is evidence that this may played a major role in representation um, and change within literary prizes when it comes to representation too. So Best argues that the prizes are established as a solution to a claimed problem, whereby new social words world form consisting of participants who have shared uh, a shared perception of being disadvantaged and the prizes legitimize the existence of these new social worlds. Within these worlds, a new order is created that does not suit everyone and so the process begins again. This explains why there are so many literary prizes. It's because they seek to represent and legitimize many different groups of people who feel disadvantaged by the status quo for many different reasons. Though so this is exactly why we have so many literary prizes. We have a lot of prizes, too, that are deliberately for underrepresented groups. So uh, prizes for queer writers, prizes for African-American writers or Asian writers or women writers, um, any minority, really. Um, so that's a good reason to keep having these literary prizes. Two graphs that I found that really showcase the effect of the Women's Prize um, on the Booker Prize. So for the figure one, we have percentage of female Booker Prize judges in the years 1969 to 2017. You can really see that um, it starts out low and it's been kind of a wave or up or down, but it usually uh, stays below the 50% mark. Um, 
it's not until after the 1993 that we get above the 50% mark and we start to have more women judges uh, judging the, the Booker Prize. And then we have a huge spike in 2017 as well. Um, in 2018 and 2019, we have two women authors winning the Booker Prize. However, in 2020, it goes back to a man, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, and so uh, you can see that there's there's a spike there um, in terms of in terms of the judges. Um, and figure two, we have percentage of female Booker shortlisted authors in the years 1969 to 2017 again. And in this case, we can see that between 1969 and 1991, the red line keeps going down until we le reach the lowest. 1991, no women. And then once we start moving upwards um, past 1991, after the development of the Women's Prize in Fiction, uh, women's representation within the Booker Prize starts to go up again. So we have the Booker and we have controversy. Uh, with any major literary prize, there's always going to be some controversy. And in the case of the Booker, they really profit off of controversy. It's just like any other um, pop culture phenomenon, the Oscar, the more drama there is, the more likely people are going to tune in, the more likely people are going to buy the books. So although many Booker books sh explore uh, similar themes, representation between the Booker authors and literary merit of the winners has always been a consistent issue, especially when publishers can only nominate so many books for the prize a year based off of previous winners. The publishing house might not choose the best book, but rather the book they think is most likely to win and sell post-prize announcement. That's why we have some years where people are like, none of these books were good or the winner was awful. We also have a new phenomenon as well within the last 40 years as we've been kind of exploring. Most of the books that we've read have been realistic fiction, but the reality is is that more genre fiction books are winning prestigious prizes and calling into question the idea of literary fiction. So particularly historical fiction and magical realism books have been winning a lot of, a lot of prizes lately. And so this calls into question what gives a book literary merit. And the term literary fiction, after all, wasn't invented until the 1960s. It was a way for publishers to distinguish between realistic and experimental fiction versus genre fiction that didn't push social boundaries and promoted escapism instead of thought-provoking narratives for social change. Um, however, we now know particularly that Speculative fiction is an excellent, excellent genre um, for thought-provoking narratives calling into question the ways of our society. So it's not just literary fiction that can do that. After a rocky start, the prize settled into its niche and exploited its journalistic capital by positioning itself in the center of scandal. Every year, the Booker Prize announcement has sparked controversy. For example, Lincoln and the Barbo by George Sanders. Saunders won the 2017 prize only to become known in the book industry as the lowest selling Booker winner in the year of its win and provoked discussion of whether literary fiction was dead, despite the book being heralded as utterly original by judges and seemingly the perfect Booker winner. So again, that's just calling into question what makes literary fiction versus speculative fiction or genre fiction worthy of literary merit. And that brings us to today and the Booker Prize in pandemic era 2020. So we have Shogi Bane in 2020, The Promise in 2021, and I'm probably going to butcher this title, The Seven Moons of Mali Almedea um, in 2022. So what do the pandemic books have in common? Similar to all the Booker books that we have read already, we have generational trauma, family, death, we have differences in race, gender, sexuality, I didn't add this, but also economic disparity. Um, and we have three different countries that have dealt with colonialist issues. So Scotland, South Africa, Sri Lanka. And we have the fact that all three in the last uh, three years 
have been male writers. Brings us to today in 2023 and the announcement of the shortlist. So before I get into the shortlist books, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on the Booker Prize 2023 uh, judges. I think it's incredibly important when we're talking about diversity in literature and literary prize culture that we also talk about the diversity within the panel judges as well. Um, 2023 Bookers, I'm probably going to butcher everyone's name, so I apologize in advance, Um, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a lay down on who is judging uh, the books this year. I believe the winners are going to be coming out um, next week, or the 26th, I think. So we have Ezi Adyujin, uh, who is internationally best-selling author and was shortlisted for the 2018 Booker Prize. Um, and has won several um, literary prizes. We have Mary Jean Chan, who lives in Oxford as a senior lecturer in creative writing poetry, also someone who has won numerous, numerous prizes. We have Ajoja Endo, who is a judge for the 23 uh, Booker Prize as well. And she's one of Britain's leading actors, most known for her role now as Lady Danbury in the hit Netflix series Bridgerton. So for all my folks who haven't seen Bridgerton yet, you got to you got to get on that. It's pretty good. Um, And she was nominated for Outstanding Supporting um, Actress for that. We have Robert Webb, who is an actor and a writer. He has a documentary, My Life in Verse, which focuses on the life of T.S. Eliot. He also has a memoir that was published in 2017, How Not to Be a Boy. And he has uh, his debut novel is Come Again, which was published in 2020. Uh, Finally, we have James Shapiro, who is a Shakespearean scholar, writer, and professor of English at Columbia University, and he has a bunch of books out. Here are our shortlists. We have Study for Obedience by Sarah Bernstein, If I Survive You by Jonathan Escoffrey, This Other Eden by Paul Harding, Prophet's Song by Paul Lynch, Western Lane by Chetna Maru, and The Beasting by Paul Murray. If I take a moment here, go back and pause so you can read what the judges said about our shortlist book or books. So what about these shortlist books? What are, what are some things going on about them? We have two Irish, two American, one Kenyan British author and another British author, two debut authors, one long list author, And we don't have any previous shortlist winning authors um, this year for the shortlist 2023 books, Um, which honestly I was kind of surprised by. There's usually usually at least one. Um, Like all the other books, there's a lot about generational trauma, family dramas, capitalism, differences in race, gender, sexuality, economics. Um, And ironically, and what I find is really, really hilarious, is that the two American books both talk about hurricanes. Um, So I just thought that was that was really funny. Um, In terms of representation, um, we have two women, four men and one person of color. So I don't think it would be a great presentation on the state of the Booker Prize without at least mentioning some of the marketing behind the Booker Prize, because that goes hand in hand with all of those um, economic merits and things like that that I was talking about earlier. Um, So the Booker Prize has these things called shortlist film series, which is really cool, actually. It's on their website, and they uh, hire actors um, to read and... Uh, to read excerpts of the book and basically try to convince a reader to to read the book. They're quite they're quite well done actually. I really really enjoyed some of them. Um, they also have interviews and book talks with the authors. They have audio books, uh, journal articles, of course, um, lots of press press on the Booker Prize um, ads in bookstores. A lot of bookstores will have a table with the short list or the long list booker books for that year so people could go into the bookstore and buy them Um, and then there's also the booker prize podcast as well that people can listen to and learn more about uh, the short list the long list and the the authors 
Uh, finally, here are my, my discussion questions. So my first question is, how do you think other literary, literary prizes specifically created for underrepresented groups will affect the future of the Booker Prize? Uh, so especially since we know that the Women's Prize in Fiction definitely affected uh, the Booker Prize. And the second question is, which shortlist book are you most interested in reading? Which seems the most accessible or readable? Uh, we talked a bit about in class how some of these books were chosen, maybe because of their sellability or marketability particularly. So based off of what you've read or seen about the shortlist, which ones do you think might be the most accessible or readable to a mass audience uh, with the most book selling possibilities? And finally, my third question is, with the most recent win being in the genre of fantasy magical realism, what do you expect to happen in the coming years when it comes to genre fiction versus literary fiction, publishing, and literary merit within literary prizes? Um, and that goes hand in hand with representation as well, I think, in terms of genre and literary merit. So uh, let me know what you think. I hope you enjoyed my presentation on the Booker Prize and the state of the Booker Prize today when it comes to literary change and representation within the publishing industry. Here are my works cited, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye!